Congressional members like AOC and Katie Porter are picking New York congressional candidate Jamal Bowman over longtime Democratic incumbent Elliot Engel. Engel, on the other hand, just got Hillary Clinton's first endorsement of a 2020 House candidate. Hmm, interesting. And now new reporting from friend of the show and the Intercept's D.C. Bureau Chief Ryan Grimm shows that a Republican super PAC is funneling money into Engel's re-election efforts. And Ryan joins us now to share more about that reporting in the race in general. Great to see you, Ryan. Good to see you, Ryan. Good to see you. Um, so what do you make of, this is the first uh, primary that Hillary Clinton has weighed into. I mean, why, did, why do you think that she decided to make this move? And as far as we know, it's the first one that the Republican establishment um, has weighed into, too. You know, she's uh, she lives nearby this uh, this di this district. Uh, her district is actually the one that Mondaire Jones is running in. But Westchester, which Elliot Engel is 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 close by. Uh, she's she's tight with Chuck Schumer. She's tight with a lot of the donors that are going to be giving you know to Elliot Engel and and to this GO GOP super PAC and to the Democratic super PAC that aligned with the GOP super PAC. So, it, it, you know, there's a lot of affinity going around here. Wow, this is, I mean, really stunning is to see the HRC, actually it's not that stunning, HRC Republican super PAC alliance. I mean, seems perfect lay, to me. lay out how dire of a threat uh, Jamal Bowman seems to be to Elliot Engel. I mean, it just seems, I mean, the New York Times endorsed Jamal Bowman. I mean, so much has come down on his side that it seems like he has a very real shot here. And what is what is the establishment learning from this race, Ryan? Right, well, so, you know, Justice Democrats, you know, uh, has been backing Jamal Bowman from the very beginning, uh, the, the same organization that re recruited and backed a AOC. But it, his race really took off in the last month or so when the other progressive who was running in the race decided to drop out and consolidate behind uh, Bowman. And he, and he didn't have to do that. And it took a lot of integrity and maturity to do it because he was rightfully burned about the fact that Justice Democrats had come in from you know, out of state. Or, you know, they have New York offices, but they're a national mm -hmm. organization and you know, picked one of the two progressives in, in, in the kind of way that people criticized the DCCC for coming in and bigfooting a, a local race. But he, he read the writing on the wall. He saw that Bowman was the one that was consolidating a lot of support, and he, and he and he put the the kind of progressive cause in front in front of his own uh, anger at how it had unfolded, backed Bowman, and that's when you saw Elliot Engel really start to collapse because he had been really banking on the progressive vote uh, being being split and kind of sneaking through and surviving that way. But one, mm. once it was a one on one race, that's when he started to fall apart. That's when he was uh, busted, kind of lying about whether or not he had been. In the Bronx during the pandemic, he'd actually uh, been in Maryland. He was confronted by a reporter in his driveway in Maryland, and he said, "I'm in both places." And the reporter wow. said, "What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean you're in both places?" There, there had been there had been local politicians who'd been saying it was great to see Elliot Engel at this event, you know, handing out supply relief supplies when Elliot Engel hadn't been there and was was in Maryland. So then he's pressured to come back to the district. Then he has that infamous hot mic gaffe where he's 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 pleading to be able to speak. And, and apologizes for wanting to speak, saying, if I didn't have a primary, I wouldn't care. Once that happened, you start to see a lot of uh, politicians jump in on the side of Bowman. They're like, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to miss this train. And then once they see that Elliot Engel is under threat, the establishment has really ridden to the rescue. And we're not talking a small amount of money that they're spending. There's been, there's been a million dollars in, in dark money and big money pumped in on the outside from this yeah. GOP pack and, and, and others, you know, since the end of May. Right. Yeah. Ryan, well, just to quickly interject here, actually just literally just broke news. Uh, Elizabeth Warren just endorsed uh, Jamal Bowman. Yeah. So, well, and I yeah. think, Ryan, one of the things yeah. that is really important and different here is when AOC uh, was challenging Crowley in the primary, uh, I believe Ro Khanna may have endorsed both of them. But nobody else, right, mm -hmm. nobody else backed AOC. And it was almost like controversial, this idea that you even primary incumbents. Now you see that dam has really burst. And you see a number of more progressive members obviously waiting in on the side of Jim Ball and Bowman. I mean, that seems like a really significant shift in terms of these intra-party politics. Yeah, you have this situation where the, the DCCC has an explicit written down policy that if anybody in the, in the democratic consulting universe helps a primary challenger they are dead to the DCCC. that they can they can never get business again 
from the digital zoo. They're, they're, they're blacklisted for good. You have that situation going on while at the same time, like you said, you have Katie Porter, uh, who was a red to blue member, who's, who's now endorsing a freshman from California. She's now endorsing Jamal Bowen. Then you have people in the Senate side, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, and then Ocasio-Cortez back in the House, all endorsing. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that's, it's, not, it's not only kind of a, a slap to the face of the incumbent, but to the policy that you, you can't have primaries. Although there, there is a habit of people endorsing kind of across chambers. You know, Steny Hoyer is is helping Kennedy in in Massachusetts, even though Steny Hoyer doesn't believe in primaries in the House, primaries hmm. in the Senate are okay with Steny Hoyer. Right. I mean, what's really your last name is Kennedy. It's different, apparently. Yes. Different, <laughs> different rules apply. Different, different rules. That's, that's yeah. right. I mean, one of the things I'm interested in, Ryan, is how this shakes up the power structure in Washington, because what Crystal was alluding to was that they used to have quite a lot of power there um, in terms of how they could stop you from endorsing somebody like AOC. But with such a wide swath of candidates now, is this breaking the Democratic establishment's ability to control who people can work for and who are not? I mean, not exactly, because uh. look at how much energy the progressive movement has had to put into uh, just making this this race competitive. And who knows, maybe there'll be enough pro-Israel dark money, you know, that that flows into the district in the end uh, and angle even even survives. But, you know, it took it took justice Democrats, uh, you know, going all in uh, from the beginning, it takes a New York Times endorsement, Working Families Party, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, and then a whole slew of other. Um, you know, members of the kind of constellation of the of the left and progressive universe just to just to make it competitive. You know, hmm. the, you you need 218 for a majority. So you know, if if they could pull off one or two of these a cycle, it would take them 200 years to you know to to fill up the House of Representatives. Right. So what they what they what they need to do is what the Tea Party did, which is you know win a handful of races and then scare everybody else to the left. So that they don't become the the next Joe Crowley or the or the or the next Elliot Engel. Otherwise, they're going to sit around and say, "Well, okay, they might pick off one or two of us a year." Now, if Yvette, if Yvette Clark or or Carolyn Maloney um, also go down on on June 23rd, then then you start to have people thinking, "Okay, the, the chance that I could lose my race is getting getting much higher." You know, yeah. Lipinski, Lipinski went down. Cuellar survived by 2,700 votes. Uh, and now you lose you know, Clark Maloney and Elliot Engel all at once. That starts to uh, create some type of a shift. Well, and I think also the spectacle of seeing your colleagues endorse against the incumbent. Right. I mean, that has to be significant as well. And not just Bernie Sanders and AOC, but Elizabeth Warren and Katie Porter as well. Um, Ryan, talk about the reporting you have here on the Republican super PAC who was weighted in. What did they... What do they see as uh, the important issues? Like, what do they have to gain from this? Why are they jumping in with their money, too? Uh, it, it appears to be a, around the issue of Israel-Palestine. Uh, and there's interest, there, There's two different things going on here, although, although both are similar. One is a, a Republican super PAC which, with a hilarious name called Americans for Tomorrow's Future. Uh, <laughs> they, they, so... <laughs> So it's like some they, South Park like from stuff beat. right there. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. can't it's make so that good. up. <laughs> so they, they, they funneled $100,000 into a Democratic super PAC called uh, DMFI, Democratic Majority uh, for Israel, which you may remember spent a lot of money against Bernie Sanders in the in the presidential primary. So that's the money that we know about. And those, you know, those are the Republican donors that are, that are putting that money in. The, the money that we don't know about is also interesting. And also from two funny, uh, funnily named organizations that that use the same media firm and have the same treasure, so they're basically the same the same thing. Uh, they don't they don't use real words. They're doing the corporate made up word thing. One of them is called Avacy Initiatives, and the other is called Parasol Practical, and they're and they're both using this media firm called Red Mountain LLC, which, as far as we know, has no digital footprint. It was just made up for the purpose of doing this. The only race they've spent any money in other than this is against Valerie Plame in, the, in a recent primary. Uh, Valerie Plame uh, had some legitimate, it went on this legitimately anti-Semitic rant a couple years ago. And so uh, a pro-Israel organization would have every justified reason to go against Valerie Plame in a, in a Democratic primary. But why would you not do it with your name attached to it? 
like, you know, and so the only answer would be, well, this is this is big Republican money. This is mm. money that is so toxic in a Democratic primary that it can't come in. Now, the the, the name on the on the documents is David Crone. Uh, David Crone is Harry Reid's former chief of staff. Harry Reid has a lot of tight connections with Republicans in Nevada because they had joint interests around gambling. The 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 Republican that he had the closest connections with, who had the most interest in 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 gambling, was Sheldon Adelson. You know, Sheldon Adelson also happens to be probably the most generous pro-Israel political donor in the United States. He's also right. He also knows that he would want not want his name tossed around in a Democratic primary because it, it would cancel whichever candidate he was trying to support. So if you were running through a theory of who this money would be, mm. it, it would be something along those lines. And that oh. and that money now being spent heavily on behalf of Elliot Engel. Yeah, yeah. Follow may not be able may not be able to save him. I though. love that daisy chain of. Yeah. <laughs> All the way leading back. <laughs> the, right wading through stuff. every angle and corner incredible. of the swamp. Just Ryan, incredible. thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. Got it. Next on Rising, the 2020 Democratic Convention, much like the campaign, is seeing a complete reimagining with no crowds. The Daily Beast, Hannah Trudeau, tells us more when Rising returns.